keeping that definition of polyphony in mind and keeping that definition of synthesizer in mind, let us approach the whole confusing question that is, what is polyphony? Like I said, originally, the term polyphony had nothing to do with synthesizers. And the point at which I'm going to describe what I would call the first polyphonic synthesizer was a, term, a time when the term synthesizer had not been coined. And the term polyphony, as we use it, had not been coined and couldn't be applied. So basically, I'm going to tell you that the first polyphonic synthesizer uh, was neither polyphonic nor a synthesizer because those terms didn't exist yet. So there's a bit of retronym going on here. But really, like I said, in regard to comparing different synthesizers, what how do we come to a standard definition of the synthesizer? When we identify the unique characteristics of a synthesizer, we realize that synthesizers existed before 1964 or 1963. Uh, the same intents, the same functionalities, and even the same sounds existed long before uh, the time where we typically say, when was the synthesizer invented? Which was, you know, 1964. It's the modern synthesizer. There were devices before that that fit the description. So in my description of this polyphonic history, I'm going to refer to things as synthesizers that did not, that were not at their time called synthesizers, but do fit the category that I've created. All right. So if synthesis wasn't invented in 1964, what year was it invented? Well, we can stumble backward and go backward and go backward. And really the first device that could be described as being electronic and with the intention of shaping timbre was a device in 1897 called the Telharmonium. Uh, inventor Thaddeus Cahill created an amazing device right at the intersection of the composer's desire from the night. Okay. What basically happened was at the end of the 19th century, composers had been using the orchestra in various forms for centuries. And with technological and cultural development, composers were feeling an urge to break away from traditional norms and create new styles of music using new instruments and new timbres. And right at that time, technology had advanced to the point where we were finding new uses for electricity. Not only could it create light, but it could be used in a number of ways. After Fourier defined the fact that a waveform could be broken down into component parts, basically the atoms of sound, individual sine waves of increasing frequency and decreasing amplitude, after that idea was postulated, people realized that if we can take a waveform and break it into component signs, you can also take signs and combine them to create complex waveforms, which is what Helmholtz did in his experiments in the late 19th century. So basically, we discovered the harmonics of sound and we also discovered that electricity could be used to employ those harmonics. Because let's face it, up until the turn of the 20th century, the main way we made sound was to vibrate objects. We had to move things back and forth in order to make different timbres. And then the different size, shape, and resonant qualities of any object led to the timbre that it generated. That is a very complex and kind of backwards way to create timbres. So the notion that A, we wanted to create new timbres and B, we could create new timbres by vibrating electrons back and forth, which is considerably easier than vibrating objects back and forth. These two things intersected right at basically the turn of the 20th century and right when Thaddeus Cahill was doing experiments and Thaddeus came Thaddeus Cahill came to the conclusion that he could build a device that would allow the user to author timbre 
using the harmonic series, using additive synthesis, basically also had not been coined at that point. And also use these things in a musical way. So that is why this device, the Tell Harmonium, fits my definition of synthesizer. And really, it was the first one. It was the first one to completely adequately pursue these two avenues simultaneously. So Thaddeus Cahill made this thing and how did it work? Okay, as you know, or I hope you know, and if you don't know, it's something you need to look into and someday I'll do a video on it because that would probably be as long as this video will be. It, any complex waveform can be broken down into component sine waves. So if you can generate sine waves in the right ways, you can build complex waveforms, complex timbres. So one way to do this with resonant sounds, sounds that are tonal, like my voice is, or like a musical instrument is, the sign pattern, the, sh the ways that the signs interact with each other in a tonal sound is called the harmonic series. There are very specific ways, there's very specific frequencies and amplitudes of the component sine waves that result in specific timbres. So, and like I said, they increase in frequency and decrease in amplitude, and there are certain frequencies that make up the harmonic series. So if you're going to make a tonal sound out of sine waves, you have to follow the harmonic series, which is the fundamental and then twice the frequency of the fundamental and half the amplitude, and then three times the frequency of the fundamental, and then one third the amplitude, and so on, so on, so on. If you continue to follow that mathematical structure, you will arrive at a sawtooth wave. Okay, so what Cahill did, the way that he generated those increasing frequencies and decreasing amplitudes was to create what was called a rheotome, which was an axle with cogs on it. And the cogs corresponded to those proportions. The biggest cogs were the loudest and the teeth represented individual iterations of the wave shape, the sine wave. It wasn't exactly a sine wave, it was actually a square wave, but it was cur it was calmed into a different wave shape later. Anyway, so in the rhea tone represented one tone with multiple cogs representing the frequencies present in the harmonic series, basically. And so if you make that device and you spin it at a constant speed, you can make the cogs in specific sizes with specific amounts of teeth to generate tones. And that's what he did. So if you're gonna make a device that way, it can't be a monophonic device term had not been coined yet it can't be a solo instrument because to change the frequency that you would hear of that tone you'd have to change the speed of the rio tones rotation which would require you to have a variable speed motor of incredible accuracy which did not exist in 1897 so of course if you want to be able to play individual notes with this thing you've got to make a lot of rio tones in relationships frequency relationships of basically the 12 step Western whatever. So what Cahill did is he made a bunch of rheotomes with the mathematical harmonic structure on them. And then each individual one represented changes in frequency that would be consistent with say a piano. So I can't remember the exact amount of rheotomes that the Telharmonium had, but there were a lot and they were quite big because amplitude couldn't be created with an amp. Amps had not been created yet, had not been invented yet. So to create a loud sound, you had to have a big cog moving thing, moving electrons back and forth in a big way. So basically these things were dynamos. Okay, so you've got a lot of rheotomes. Are you still gonna make a solo instrument where with each note only the rheotome associated with that note plays? No, of course not. You can have all of them play at once and you can mix them together. So what we have then is a device that is designed to author timbre. We have a device that is electronic, although it is also electromechanical, the way that the electrons are initially moved, uh, mechanical, but the outcome is an electronic sound designed uh, to author timbre 
and can play multiple notes at once. When you play the telharmonium, you could play it like a piano. You could play big, huge chords, small chords, whatever. Of course, it did have a unique keyboard design that was not entirely like a piano, and it required two people to effectively play the thing. But importantly, it could play multiple iterations, multiple tones, multiple oscillators at once, and it was electronic. So basically what we're talking about is the first synthesizer and also the first polyphonic synthesizer. So it's interesting, we always think like if someone says, well, when, when was poly polyphony invented? When, when did polyphonic synthesizers come out? You'll most typically see someone say, well, that's 1975. And in a way that's kind of true, but in a way it's not true. Polyphonic synthesizers came out the year that synthesizers came out, which was 1897, or more specifically 1906, which is when the, the best version of the telharmonium was made. So here we have the origin of both synthesizers and uh, polyphony. But of course, no one was talking about those two things. This was a new instrument doing a new thing. The terminology wasn't necessary because there was nothing to compare it to. It was what it was, and that was it. So of course, the telharmonium and this cultural movement that I described where composers were looking for new means of creating new music and new timbres for new music, and engineers were excitedly applying electronics to sound, many unique instruments were created in those initial years 